you are very welcome. I just wanted to get that out of the way because this week I'm doing something a little bit different. Right? In addition to your regular Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday Philip DeFranco show that comes out around 5 p.m. Eastern, 2 p.m. Pacific, you'll also be getting one of these, a morning news video into a very interesting news story. So I can help all you beautiful bastards get started with your day and then come back a few hours later and watch the full show. And so with that, I gotta say, this morning we gotta talk about what has Matt Gates and Ilhan Omar on the same side? Because that is an incredibly rare thing. But at the end of last month, those two lawmakers found a small piece of common ground and it was found in Africa. So Gates forced a vote in the House on a resolution to direct President Biden to remove all U.S. troops from Somalia within a year except for a handful who would guard the embassy. With them calling U.S. involvement, they're a costly and mostly fruitless endeavor that has no end in sight. Now if you're hearing this and you're thinking, wait, the military that my tax dollars are funding is where? You're not alone, because unbeknownst to many Americans, the U.S. has been meddling in Somalia in one way or another for decades, with troops stationed there since around 2007. And there, they've been propping up a flimsy local government while fighting the Islamic militant group Al-Shabaab, as well as other smaller groups. But right before he very reluctantly left office, Trump ordered nearly all troops, about 700 at the time, out of the country. But don't get confused, right? This wasn't some kind of progressive anti-war move. Right? Most of the soldiers were just simply redeployed to Kenya or Djibouti, where they continued their work in Somalia just from across the border. Plus, even before that, Trump loosened controls on airstrikes and significantly escalated combat activities. Activity. But even still, Biden reversed that decision a few months after he got in, putting about 500 troops back in Somalia. And that came as an absolute surprise to many observers because he was stressing the need to end such wars on the campaign trail and even reiterating that a few months later during the Afghan withdrawal. American troops shouldn't be used as a bargaining chip between warring parties in other countries. And it's time to end the forever war. So when the Times asked a White House official why Biden pulled out of Afghanistan but did the exact opposite in Somalia, they gave two reasons. First, saying the Taliban had not expressed any intention of attacking the United States. And second, saying other militant groups groups in Afghanistan did not control significant enclaves of territory from which to operate and plan. But that second point is actually contradicted by the intel documents that were recently leaked on Discord, those notably including a Pentagon assessment that warns that Afghanistan has become a significant staging ground for terrorist groups, and the Islamic State reportedly planning attacks across Europe and Asia and conducting, quote, aspirational plotting against the United States. But whatever its practical reasons are, the White House cites the 2001 Authorization for Use of Military Force, or AUMF, to legally justify its presence in Somalia. With that being a law signed after 9-11 that authorized the executive branch to pursue al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Except there, the wording was so broad that you had critics saying that it was going to be used as a blank check to wage the global war on terror. And in fact, the past four presidents have cited it for at least 41 military operations in at least 19 different countries, often against groups that didn't even exist when the Twin Towers fell. When looking back at the past two decades, critics argue we don't have much to show for it. Right? In 2002 and 2003, the State Department counted a grand total of nine terror attacks across the entire continent of Africa. But now, that number is actually several thousand every year. Moreover, the African Center for Strategic Studies, a Pentagon Research Institute, reported last year that, quote, militant Islam Islamist group violence in Africa has risen inexorably over the past decade, expanding by 300% during this time. And in Somalia, you see the same trend, with Al-Shabaab attacks increasing 60% since 2017, as well as fatalities linked to Al-Shabaab jumping from just over 2,600 in 2021 to over 6,200 last year. And that's despite the U.S. spending billions of dollars at minimum on operations in the country, though the total actual number is unknown, as well as executing more than 275 airstrikes and commando raids, not to mention the nearly 20,000 troops and helicopters provided by the African Union to reinforce the Somali military. So all of that raises the question of where have we gone wrong? And there's actually many different answers, but one of them comes from Brown University's Cost of War Project, which argues that the U.S. presence is actually stirring up conflict, not eliminating it. With them saying that the U.S. spends more on counterterrorism in Somalia each year than the federal Somali government earns in tax revenue, flooding Somalia with funding for militarized counterterrorism and thereby diverting resources away from real conflict resolution solutions. Also arguing that the Americans' top-down approach to favoring the centralized government just can't work in Somalia, where local dynamics like clan allegiances dictate the political arena. Meaning that the central government just has limited influence outside the capital and people in the rest of the country just feel alienated from it in the United States. It's basically the argument that the challenge in Somalia is a political one, not a military one, and thus the solution won't be found on the battlefield, which was also the conclusion reached in the 2008 study by the Rand Corporation. With that, looking at 648 historical cases of militant groups and finding that only 7% were defeated through military efforts, whereas over 80% of groups ended either because they joined the political process or key members were arrested or killed by local police and intelligence. But others also argue that regardless of the data or the local dynamics, the U.S. shouldn't be in Somalia just because it helped create the terrorism there to begin with. Right, to be sure, that country's been ripped apart by warring clans since even before America put its boots on the ground. With the government collapsing in 1991 and the Pentagon sending troops in the next year to provide humanitarian support, and then pulling back out almost as fast as it arrived after militants shot down two Black Hawk helicopters killing 18 American soldiers. But then, in 2006, something massive happened. An Islamist group quickly ousted the most heavily entrenched warlords and, within six months, accomplished what nobody had been able to do for 15 years before and the more than 15 years since. They formed a stable government that centralized political power 
power over 90% of the Somali countryside. But I'm also providing essential services like schools, hospitals, and courts, which gave them their name, the Islamic Courts Union. And their military wing, going by a more familiar name, Al-Shabaab. So it actually looked like a civil war might finally come to an end, but then the U.S. backed a three-year-long Ethiopian invasion that toppled the ICU. So then, with their civilian wing all of a sudden cut off, Al-Shabaab's commanders became a more extreme jihadist insurgency, even welcoming a host of foreign fighters under their ranks. And then, in 2012, the group pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda, giving the White House all the excuse it needed to carry on bombing the country. And then in 2016, an Islamic State affiliate emerged, where it continues to cause havoc to this day. But counterterrorism also isn't the only reason Washington has its eye on the Horn of Africa. Right, some, like AFRICOM Commander General Michael Langley, argue we need troops there to maintain access to a strategic oil shipping route. With Somalia's proximity to it, also the reason you hear so much about Somali pirates, as well as movies like Captain Phillips. But also, Langley and others argue that if the U.S. pulls out, it'll leave a power vacuum that might be filled by Russia or China. Right, because Beijing already has a military base in Djibouti, though it's the only one abroad, and the U.S. has one there as well. Then you also have some who argue that we can still support the Somali government without having American soldiers directly stationed there. And actually, to an extent, we've already been doing that, with the CIA and special forces organizing local proxy fighters to conduct low-profile operations. So even that has its drawbacks. Right? Some proxies, like the Danab Brigade, have been implicated in the abuse and arbitrary arrest of civilians. And Somali political elites have reportedly used U.S.-trained forces to persecute their own political opponents. So that's not what we'd call new for the Pentagon in Africa. Right? Since 2008, U.S.-trained officers have succeeded in at least eight coups across five West African countries. Nor is our covert support for proxies new to Africa. Right? According to the Brennan Center for Justice, the U.S. has fought so-called secret wars in more than a dozen countries over the past two decades. And these including many in Africa like Egypt, Cameroon, Kenya, Libya, Mali, Mauritania, Niger, Nigeria, Somalia, and Tunisia, where American commandos and advisors trained, funded, and employed local proxies to fight U.S. targets, often with minimal congressional oversight. So to bring us back, Matt Gaetz's bill last month to get U.S. troops out of Somalia is just the first step in winding down American involvement there, and barely puts a dent in the global war on terror. Yet when the House actually voted on it, 321 lawmakers shot it down, with the 102 in favor being roughly split between far-right Republicans and far-left or progressive Democrats. Which is why during the floor debate, you saw something that's rare in D.C. nowadays. Lawmakers detracting from others within their own party and reaching out to back some across the aisle. And to the extent that foreign influences could be helpful, I would argue that the African Union is far better positioned to build a stronger sense of national identity and national unity among clans that have been warring in Somalia for generations than U.S. troops. And this idea that we're going to play this terrorist whack-a-mole where every time one pops up, we send a new force, does nothing to actually try and help with stabilization. You can't point to a single agenda, whether it was Afghanistan, Iraq, Somalia, whether it was Libyan support. You can't point to a single one where our presence has actually led to greater stability. I would make the case that because we have forces all around the world, we have been a safer place. There's another group of adversaries to keep in mind as well. Russia and the Communist Party of China would like nothing more than to see the U.S. take a, f a foreign policy of isolationism. And this may not be over, with Gates suggesting that his next resolution might be to order U.S. troops out of Niger. And his last one, early in 2022, tried to withdraw 900 troops from Syria, but that was voted down as well. So at least for now, it seems like the war machine is just going to keep on keeping on. Which is why I'm going to leave you with two final things. One, I'd absolutely love to know your thoughts on this news story and this whole situation in those comments down below. And two, Thank you for watching the first of this week's new morning videos. And remember, later today or in just a few hours, depending on when you're watching this, you're still getting that brand new full Philip DeFranco show. So make sure you're subscribed and I'll see you in a little bit.